Um, well, as I said, welcome everyone. I'm delighted to see all of you virtually for this very special presentation, which is part of Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau program. And Humanities Washington is a nonprofit organization dedicated to opening minds and bridging divides by creating spaces to explore different perspectives. Um, thanks to support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Washington Secretary of State, the Thomas Foley Institute for Public Policy and Public Service at Washington State University, and generous private donors, Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau presenters visit all corners of the state, including virtually, as we can see. I would encourage you to visit Humanities Washington's website, www.humanities.org, to find other events like this one. And I would say that even if it weren't in my script, I think that they're a great organization and the range of events and topics is amazing. Okay, so now for today's event, our presenter and guest, Ross Reynolds, is a Seattle-based interviewer, moderator, and convener. He recently served as executive producer for community engagement at KUOW, an NPR affiliate in Seattle, before he was a program host for 16 years. Um, before which he was a program host for 16 years. There we go. Um, his awards include the 2011 Public Radio News Director's First Place in the call-in category for Living in a White City, which Brooks mentioned just a, a moment ago. And um, in 2015, he was named to the University of Washington Communication Alumni Hall of Fame. His presentation today, as you likely know, is titled How Audio Technology Changed the World. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ross Reynolds. Neil, thank you so much for the introduction. I really wish I could be there in person, but uh, the next best thing. Uh, part of the reason I signed up for these is that I, my wife's been doing this for five years and traveling with her, I've gotten to see all parts of Washington State I never saw before. Um, a, a moment for uh, self-promotion, you'll see rossreynolds.com. Since I left KUOW, many of my interviews are not available at the radio station anymore. So I've set up a website where I've put some of my favorite ones. Uh, if you wanna check that out, Brene Brown is up there talking about the power of vulnerability. Uh, Cheryl Strayed talked about her book, Wild. I interviewed her just a couple of weeks after it came out. Atul Gawande, who's a doctor and also a writer for The New Yorker, right, talks about being mortal. And uh, I saw, also have Joseph Heller, the uh, novelist. So that's a few things you can check out at rossreynolds.com. Um, Neil mentioned some of the things that uh, my accomplishments, but I have to say my most cherished credential is that I am an honorary seafare pirate and my pirate name is Rotten Ross. I've been fascinated by the power of sound ever since I got involved in broadcasting. It was Garrison Keillor who once said that television is all contained in a box while radio you can transfer this to any kind of audio. It's as big as your imagination. In 1963, radio people felt threatened by television. Radio was thought to be dying. And so comedian Stan Freeberg made an advertisement for radio. Too bad about radio. No audience. Is anyone else having trouble with the audio? I am as well. Yeah, I can't hear it. Okay. That's okay. All right. It's coming out my speaker, but I guess not into my microphone. Um, hmm. Let me try sharing audio again. See if I can get that to work. Share sound and go back to the slideshow. Too bad about radio. Oh, well, what do you mean? Well, since television, you know, hardly anybody listens to radio anymore. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that if I were you. There's a radio in use for every man, woman, and teenager in America. Really? Gee, I'd hate to think of them all turning them on at once. They do. Every morning. Who listens to radio? That go where you go medium called radio. Radio? Why should I advertise on radio? There's nothing to look at, no pictures. Listen, you can do things on radio you couldn't possibly do on TV. That'll be the day. All right, watch this. 
Okay, people, and now when I give you the cue, I want the 700-foot mountain of whipped cream to roll into Lake Michigan, which has been drained and filled with hot chocolate. Then the Royal Canadian Air Force will fly overhead towing a 10-ton maraschino cherry, which will be dropped into the whipped cream for the cheering of 25,000 extras. All right, cue them out. Reporting in progress. Cue the Air Force. Cue the maraschino cherry. Okay, 25,000 cheering extras. Now, you want to try that on television? Of course, today, television movies can easily recreate Lake Michigan filled with hot chocolate and a maraschino cherry on top, or the destruction of Los Angeles in an earthquake, or a Paris street rolling over on itself like it did in the film Inception. But sound tra taps into imagination and emotion in ways that visual stimulus does not. Perhaps that's because, as media theorist Marshall McLuhan famously said, the medium is the message. And by that, he meant the way the message is conveyed and received can be just as important as the content of the message itself. Think about if you read the words she wept, that's very different than hearing the sound of a woman weeping or seeing a film of a woman weeping. Television, books, the internet are all different media and each medium changes us in different ways. We create communications media and by using those media, they affect us. Consider for a moment the use of internet and social media. It seems to have shortened our attention spans in the direction of tweets, and 60 second videos on TikTok. TV and internet are what Marshall McLuhan would call hot media, which means they contain a lot of information. A hot medium saturates your sentence, saturates your senses. Audio, particularly low quality audio, like phone calls, is what McLuhan called cool media. It provides less information, and as a result, our brains need to work harder. We turn the sound into pictures in our minds. Now, perhaps some of you listen to me on the radio. I know some of you did and had a picture of what I look like and then you got a chance to see what I really look like, which I either confirmed or confounded your suspicions. You don't need to tell me which. But our mind goes to work in creating pictures when we're listening to audio and our brain works a little bit harder. We create the images from the sound and that's why radio drama and books on tape can be so effective. Here's an example from the New York Times radio show and podcast, The Daily. Last year, they asked people to talk about the best thing that happened to them during the pandemic. This is Chris from Pukwe Varina, North Carolina. In 2017, me and my wife got married and that following year in spring of 2018, we started to try and have a baby and there were quite a few roadblocks that we encountered, um, fertility specialists, so on. And uh, this Monday I came downstairs to head to work and my wife was at the kitchen table with a positive pregnancy test. It, um, it's, it's the world to me. Uh, it's honestly really, made, really made this year worth it. Um, we are both so happy and so thrilled. We just can't wait to have a family. Hi, this is Leslie Kuretz and I live in Milton, Ontario, Canada. And the best thing that happened to me this year was the birth of my son, Nathan, on February 10th. So he's 10 months old today. My wife and I welcomed our first son this year. We welcomed twins in February of this year. <coughs> I had a baby girl. A baby boy. We welcomed our first baby, our first child, Isabel, Lucy May, Sophia, Maeve, Lillian, Enuma Elish. We called him Goose for short. Can you say anything? Hey, this is Will from Western Massachusetts. Uh, I'm a doctor out here, and unfortunately, we've had to quarantine from most people um, because of that. And things have been really difficult this year. Like, they have been for lots of people. Um, but at one point, right when I was getting ready to go to work at about 6.30 p.m., I'm a nocturnist, um, and my wife's feeling frustrated and a little lonely, totally understandably. Our daughter, who was, uh, I don't know how many months old at that point, but a little over a year, um, just decided to stand up and walk across the living room for the first time. And it was like this magical being from another universe just kind of like entered the house and became ambulatory. And we both started tearing up, kind of laughing hysterically. Um, it was like this kind of 
tear in the fabric of our day-to-day -day life that was so welcome. I've heard that piece of audio a couple of dozen times at least, and every time it affects my emotions. And in this presentation, I'd like to talk about how audio, transmitted audio, audio from somewhere far away affects us. Imagine how magical it must have been to talk on the phone to someone for the first time. They were far away, and yet they were right in your ear. And telephones show us the magic of audio. Phone calls have changed my life and probably yours. I was in a phone booth, remember them? In 1980, on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, looking out at the Atlantic Ocean, when people at cable radio in Portland, Oregon, told me I had a job as the news director. It caused me to move across the country, and it changed my life. Think of phone calls that changed your life, calling someone for a first date, a phone call from a doctor. My wife calls her brothers every week and she says, as soon as they say just a few words, she knows instantly how they're feeling. That's the power of audio. And as amazing as the phone was and is, it still was just one phone to another phone. Most of my talk today will be about one person talking to many via audio technology. That era really began in 1920. Behold in all its glory, the Mahogany Philco music radio cabinet and carved wood case. If you look closely, that forest scene in the middle is needlepoint. In the early days, radio was a treasured piece of furniture. Everyone would gather around. It was the 20th century equivalent of a luxe screening room with a 100-inch TV and surround sound. Radio is the first audio technology I'll talk about today. The first broadcast radio station went on the air in 1920, so we're just into the second century of radio. All at once, you could communicate to masses of people simultaneously. Radio collapsed space and time. And it was so new, there was no word for what radio did. So they appropriated a word from agriculture. Broadcasting meant spreading seeds. Over 26 years, you can see the definition changed to meaning carrying over the airwaves, news and entertainment and live events. It's really difficult today to imagine the impact that radio had on the world. It was a wonder. It sparked the imagination of everyone who encountered it. Radio was the first medium to connect masses of people across huge geographic areas at once. And hearing those voices was magic. A newspaper story from those early days wrote of a man who set up a radio in his home so his friends could dance to a music show. When the naughty waltz came in, we started to dance. It was great fun. One girl thought it was eerie. She said it was just like a seance, a seance, voices from beyond. And that was what people thought about radio. They soon realized the power. Politicians realized that control of radio is a means of social control in most countries. All radio is a state-run service. In the liberal democracies like Great Britain, you've got a respected service, the BBC. In Nazi Germany, propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels led the charge to create a radio cheap enough that even workers could own one, all the better to spread propaganda. The 1994 genocidal massacre in Rwanda that cost as many as 800,000 Tutsi lives was spurred on by radio broadcasts, urging the Hutu majority to begin killing their neighbors. Most revolutions of the past century began with seizing control of the radio station. Unlike other countries, the US allowed private business to control radio. This was not a given. Many felt the power of radio was too important to turn over to the market. Then Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover said, it is inconceivable that we would allow so great a possibility for service to be drowned out by advertising chatter. It's hard to imagine today when all media is saturated by ads, but in the early days of radio, it was unclear how the medium could be commercialized. It took several years for business people to realize that if you touted a product, a service, or an idea on radio, and that threw in a clever jingle, perhaps some humor, and if you repeated that message over and over, it moved people to buy a product. There was a lucrative business to be had in selling airtime to advertisers. But what do you put in between the ads? You put on the radio the biggest stars of stage, screen, and music to pull in the audience. And when you got people's attention, you could sell ads and make a fortune. It's hard to conceive today when we have the internet, TV, and radio competing for our attention, but for decades, radio was it. Radio was the mass media. Just as radio was a propaganda machine, it was also the biggest engine of culture. Radio helped spread jazz, classical, and country music across the country. Musicians like Artie Shaw, Marian Anderson, Hank Williams, and Charlie Parker were already known for their recordings, but radio brought them performing live right in your living room. Radio comedy and drama became the primary entertainment, spelling the beginning of the end for vaudeville. Orson Welles, who you can see on the right, played The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, in 1937 and 38. He co-founded the Mercury Theater. And then in 1938, they did a radio adaptation of War of the Worlds 
They wove together fake news bulletins into a music show, and many were fooled into believing creatures from Mars were invading. That's how powerful radio was. During World War II, radio took on a new role as a trusted news source. Edward R. Murrow, as many of you probably know, was the revered radio newsman. He became a national figure broadcasting live from London rooftops during the Blitz in World War II, vividly describing scanning the sky for Nazi bombers. In the 50s, Murrow did a blistering expose of Senator Joe McCarthy that helped to end the Red Scare. He attended college at what later became known as Washington State University. And of course, WSU now has the Edward R. Murrow College of Communication, and it's the home of Northwest Public Broadcasting, which covers a wide swath of Eastern Washington. The arrival of television in the 50s changed radio. As you heard in that Stan Freeberg bit at the beginning, there was fear that TV would wipe out radio. That didn't happen. Radio just evolved. The big stars of the day did go from radio to TV, but radio created their own stars, DJs and talk show hosts. Radio shows played to the strengths medium. You can see there are some of them who became stars in their own rights. Paul Harvey, Rush Limbaugh, Alan Frieden, Wolfman Jack. Radio became hyper-local. In the Midwest, radio stations broadcast commodity prices and detailed weather reports for farmers. And in areas like Seattle, traffic reports became vital. And everyone listened to the weather because kids, not that long ago, you couldn't look up at the weather instantly on your phone. Imagine that. Then in the 60s, a new form of radio became available. Now I could have played Steely Dan's FM here, but if you get the reference, it's already playing in your head. That's the power of sound. The new technology was, of course, FM radio. The broadcast signal had a much higher quality than AM. On March 1st, 1941, W47NV began broadcasting in Nashville, Tennessee, the first fully licensed commercial FM station. But to hear FM, you had to have an FM radio. And FM didn't begin to catch on until the 50s and 60s because you people had those FM radios. I have in my living room a small table with an AM radio and a coin slot. I think it came out of a roadside motel. Back then, you'd have to put in a dime to listen to a half hour of AM radio. Because the uptake on FM was so slow at first, commercial interests were slow to adopt it, which meant that radio frequencies were readily available. Universities and college, colleges like WSU and University of Washington, and even high schools like Seattle's Nathan Hale grabbed FM channels. College stations broadcast the schedule of educational radio, professors lecturing, and classical music. In the 60s, the Cultural Revolution arising from the newly empowered youth generation, the protests against the Vietnam War, the surge of rock and roll was the sound that became known as underground radio, like this station from Boston, Massachusetts. Also in the 60s, there was kind of a reawakening of interest in radio's untapped potential to spark change and enlightenment. Commercial stations like WBCN and the Pacifica, listener-sponsored network of stations, KPFA in San Francisco, WBI in New York, helped to lead the youth movement. And people also began to reconsider what radio could do. It could be a public service, creating and serving an informed public. And in that spirit, in 1967, President Lyndon Johnson and Congress created a funding mechanism for public media. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting funds public media. The original draft of the legislation funding public broadcasting was only for TV. And at the last minute, there was a change. You can see the word television got scratched out, replaced by broadcasting. So the Corporation for Public Broadcasting could allow funding for TV and radio. National Public Radio was created in 1970. And by the way, NPR no longer stands for National Public Radio. It's just NPR because it's not only a provider of radio, but also web streaming and podcasts. The first broadcast from NPR was coverage of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations hearings in the Vietnam War. The first daily program on NPR was All Things Considered, the one on the air in 1971. This is from that first broadcast. Thousands of young people came to Washington willing to risk being arrested in order to end the war. They went into the streets this morning to stop the government from functioning by clogging many Washington roads during this morning's rush hour. For many demonstrators, the mobile street tactics of civil disobedience are an expected spring event. But before today, many other young people who came to Washington had not been willing to oppose the state with their bodies. For these young Americans, today was a major test of their commitment to the ethical code of the young and the angry. It was their freedom ride, their summer march, their May Day. Stop the war!
line of young people has just come across the highway. Traffic is stopped. And here come the police. One, two, three, four police on motor scooters. One demonstrator knocked down by a motor scooter policeman. Anger now. Anger of the young people. Motor 3 on the Southwest Freeway. Have one injured down here. Could you send me uh, an ambulance, please? It's right oh, at Main yeah. Avenue. And he hit the kid. He went right through the line. He passed me and almost knocked me down. And a blue. Yeah, but it's a policeman we're talking about. A motorcycle. A policeman. A motorcycle hit him. Not a, not a, not a citizen. Right there. The man over there. Right there. Sergeant, excuse me. Jeff came in National Public Radio. Is that a technique where the men actually try to drive the bikes into the demonstrators? No, it's no technique. We're trying to go down the road and the people get in front. What are you going to do? You don't stop on a dime. It was very first, all things considered, 51 years ago. And many of the stylistic elements of public radio which have since been adopted by podcasts, they're already there on the first ATC. The use of natural sound, the you are there quality, voices that sounded like people, not the voice of God. I've been talking about terrestrial radio and that relies on a tower. AM stations require not only big towers, but also lots of land around them because the AM signal bounces off the ground into the atmosphere and back down again. But AM or FM, you need a stick to broadcast. In the 1990s, satellite radio from the upper atmosphere became available. The first satellite radio broadcasts were in Africa and the Middle East in 1999, sparsely populated areas where it's hard to place enough antennas to reach people. The first satellite radio broadcasts were in 2001, Sirius satellite radio and XM satellite radio dominated, and they later merged. In 2002, an innovation led to an entirely new form of radio, in 2002, technology allowed the placement of more digital radio frequencies. It was called HD radio. But like with FM, you needed a new radio to pick up HD. Existing radio stations could create new channels. Uh, my alma mater, KUOW, and many other public stations really jumped into this and created multiple frequencies that you could tune into. So on the main channel, you might hear classical music. You might have a channel of all news. You might have a channel of the BBC World Service. But the new technology never really caught on. The barrier of having to buy a new radio just proved to be too high for most people. In the past 10 years, the Federal Communications Commission has allowed more FM stations broadcasting at low power to go on the air. Low power means you don't reach so far. So LP FM stations are mainly in cities where you don't have to reach far to find a lot of listeners. The next audio technology transmission innovation came along with the internet, and it came from Seattle. That's Rob Glazer. He left his job at Microsoft to found Progressive Networks in 1994. And the goal at the beginning was to provide a distribution channel for politically progressive content. They produced audio programming you couldn't get on radio and distributed it over the internet. But what caught on was not the political content, it was the distribution of audio via internet and the technology known as streaming. So Glazer pivoted to streaming technology and rebranded from Progressive Networks to Real Networks. The breakthrough technology was called the real player. Suddenly the computer could speak. It was scratchy and glitchy over 300 baud modems, but the computer could talk. And as computers and internet connections got faster, the audio quality improved rapidly. One of the very earliest internet transmitted events was a baseball game between the New York Yankees and the Seattle Mariners, September 5th, 1995. And besides listening live, Audio over internet technology allowed you to download an audio file and listen at your leisure. It was the audio equivalent of a video cassette recorder that allowed you to record TV shows and watch them at a convenient time. Listening became untethered from time and the podcast was born. The first podcast, October 2003, a weekly musical talk show hosted by Matt Schichter called The Backstage Pass. Guests included BB King, Third Eye Blind and the Beach Boys, but it was still clunky to download and listen to podcasts. Then in June 2005, Apple released a new version of their music app, iTunes 4.9, that made it easy to find and download not just music, but podcasts. It can not only play on your computer, but also play on portable devices like Apple's iPod. By the way, that's how podcasts got their name. It's a mashup of iPod and broadcast. In 2014, this podcast popularized Podcasts for the masses. This is a Global Tail Link prepaid call from 
Adnan Sayed. An inmate at a Maryland correctional facility. From This American Life and WBEZ Chicago, it's Serial, one story told week by week. I'm Sarah Koenig. For the last year, I've spent every working day trying to figure out where a high school kid was for an hour after school one day in 1999. Or if you want to get technical about it, and apparently I do, where a high school kid was for 21 minutes after school one day in 1999. This search sometimes feels undignified on my part. I've had to ask about teenagers' sex lives, where, how often, with whom, about notes they passed in class, about their drug habits, their relationships with their parents. And I am not a detective or a private investigator. I'm not even a crime reporter. But yes, every day this year, I've tried to figure out the alibi of a 17-year-old boy. Over the next 12 one-hour episodes, Sarah Koenig walked us through the evidence step by step. It told a compelling story and Sarah Kenny became a character, talking us through her own doubts and her own research. The series ended up getting Adnan a review of his case. Syria was a massive success. The first episode in early 2014, October 2014. And within a month, Syria was the fastest podcast to ever reach 5 million downloads. And by the end of December 2014, it had been downloaded 40 million times. So what was it about the sound of serial and podcasting that attracts people? Well, it was a new way to present audio information and it created a different listening experience. Rebecca Mead wrote in The New Yorker that the great podcasts presented an audio, audio narrative that can be immersive in a way that radio playing in the background rarely is. Podcasts are designed to take up time rather than to be checked, scanned, and rushed through. Now, I'm sure some of you are familiar with podcasts and later on, I'd like to hear some of your favorite podcasts and why you listen to them. But uh, if you're not familiar with podcasts, you're certainly not alone. 45% of Americans have never listened to one, but that number is dropping rapidly. There are 800 million people listening to podcasts. And by 2025, that number will more than double to 2 billion. The number of podcasts is also increasing astronomically. As of December, 2020, Apple hosted 1.68 million podcasts. Here are the most popular the Joe Rogan experience is on Spotify and audio content streaming service. It's been the news lately because you might have read Neil Young, Johnny Mitchell, and other musicians objected to COVID-19 misinformation being propagated on Rogan's program. So they asked to have their music taken off the service for a while. The Daily from the New York Times also airs as a radio show on KUOW and other radio stations. It takes one topic in the news and gives you a chronology. It's really a wonderful podcast, one of my favorites. Since Serial, true crime podcasts have taken off like Crime Junkie and My Favorite Murder. This American Life began as a public radio program. And in fact, it is the progenitor of the serial. The producers for serial came from This American Life. When you trace back some of the most popular podcasts, it almost inevitably leads back to This American Life. Stuff You Should Know is exactly that. Episodes explain champagne, Satanism, the Stonewall Uprising, and chaos theory. Office Ladies is a podcast about the TV show, The Office, with two of the program stars, Jenna Fisher and Angela Kinsey. Ben Shapiro is a conservative commentary program. Podcasts are a boon to anyone with an idea that wants to reach a large audience directly. And perhaps there are some local podcasts there that you know of, tell me about them. It's really a great chance to work without going through a radio station or a radio network. The internet connects you potentially to a worldwide audience. You can create something with a personal voice. You can talk about the stories that fascinate you. Joe Rogan and Mark Maron are examples of long form interviews. For some people, podcasts have replaced radio listening, which is a concern for radio broadcasters. The radio audience has been contracting for some time now. And one big reason is that there are a lot of other ways to listen besides radio. And it's easy to podcast if you know some of the basics of audio production. A microphone, a computer, a high-speed internet connection, an audio recorder, digital audio editing software, and you're good to go. The ease of podcasting and the increased number of users has led everyone and their sister to start a podcast. If you're a celebrity, chances are you've been on a podcast or you have your own. Anyone interested in anything, from bird calls to politics to knitting to true crime to music, can find multiple podcasts by people who share your obsession. There are an estimated 2 million podcasts and over 48 million episodes. 2014, along with being the birthday of Serial, 
It was also the year that Amazon launched a brand new type of device that radically changed audio. Our artificial intelligence had reached the level that the computers could understand speech. Telephones got that little microphone icon and you could say, call Harriet instead of pushing the buttons. In 2014, Amazon introduced the smart speaker that responds to questions and commands with answers and actions. There are smart speakers from Amazon, Sonos, Apple, Google, and others. I've got one of Amazon's. It's that little pocky, hockey puck in the lower right-hand corner. It's called Alexa. What's a smart speaker? Can you still hear me? Okay, great. So Alexa's a little bit shy today. They're called smart speakers, but unfortunately, they're not terrifically bright. I asked Alexa if she was safe to use because there are privacy concerns. She said she couldn't answer. Technically, smart speakers are always hearing, but makers say they're not listening to your conversations unless you use one of the wake up words. So how many people have smart speakers in the US? Smart speaker use is growing rapidly. It's quintupled within the last two years. And a marketing firm estimates that about 18 million smart speakers were shipped in America in the fourth quarter of 2020. But as you can see from that graph, two thirds of Americans don't wanna have a smart speaker. One reason is privacy concerns. In just one year, the number of people moderately or very concerned about smart speaker privacy has gone up rapidly. My wife goes crazy with this little hockey puck when she thinks it's listening. There is good reason for suspicion. In 2017, Google Home Mini saved recordings at times when the wake up word was not used. In 2018, an Amazon Echo sent private audio recorded in a home to someone on the owner's contact list without permission. Imagine having a conversation in a home with someone in your family. And a couple of minutes later, someone you happen to know from across the country calls up and said, I just heard you talking to your wife. That actually happened. They said it was extremely rare and would not happen again. In 2019, Amazon admitted that thousands of its employees were listening to recordings made on its smart speakers and transcribing what they heard. It's a basic equation, convenience versus privacy. And despite the concerns, convenience appears to be winning with sales rising steadily. So I'm really curious to hear about your use or non-use of smart speakers. Here's a few of the new trends to look at in audio transmission in the coming months. Remember when I told you that one of the first broadcasts to stream over the internet was a Seattle Mariners game? Well, that took a lot of organizing. Now there are several new apps that aim to make it easy for anyone to do a talk show or to DJ a music show from their phone. It's been called social audio and live transmission audio you can sign up for. These apps have also been called audio only chat apps. So here's how it works. You sign up and you can just start doing a radio show with music or a talk show. And if you can get people to listen into it, it's as though you've got your own broadcast radio station. Of course, anyone else can do this too. So celebrities like Elon Musk and Bill Gates are already on these apps. So good luck getting attention to your music or talk. Spotify has something called Green Room. Amazon has a new one called Amp. And Clubhouse is an independent company, which if current tech trends continue, will be purchased by Apple or another one of the giants before this talk is even over. So that's a little bit about brought the landscape of broadcast media and just audio transmission in its many different forms. And I'm really curious to hear some more from you about perhaps your relationship to radio, perhaps the way that audio has really affected you. Um, you can just turn on your microphone and speak, or if there are any comments that are down in the chat section, uh, you can also put your comments there if you're a little bit shy about it. And before I get to that, though, I would like to suggest some further reading for you to do. I was fascinated by Eric Barno's history of early radio. It's really an amazing portrait of this unique moment in human history, the birth of mass media. Marshall McLuhan's the theory of media is heavy reading. I did a college paper on it, believe me, but his thoughts are really well summarized in this entertaining graphic work, The Medium is the Massage. Brooke Gladstone may be familiar to some of you as the host of public radio's On the Media, one of the best shows on public radio. And she takes on the history of news in this illustrated book. And finally, Jill Abramson focuses on how news has changed because of changes in technology from newspapers to the web and on to social media. So enough of me. Hopefully I've got you thinking a little bit about how audio transmission has changed your life or just been something that you spent time doing. If you've got questions, I can try to answer them. I've been in public radio since the mid 1970s. So if it's a general question, I might be able to handle it. But I wanna know what radio stations or shows do you listen to and why? 
How about podcasts? Do you listen to books on tape? Is listening to a book cheating? In a previous session, we had a literature professor wondering about her students listening rather than reading and questioning whether it was the same experience and as good or valuable as, as the reading experience. And I'd love to hear about your experience with smart speakers. It's this whole new form of audio transmission that is two-way. Smart speakers listen to you and respond. Are you comfortable talking to a machine and having it answer back? Are you comfortable with having your kids talk to a smart speaker? In one of the previous sessions, someone said they really didn't like the smart speaker because their kids would just start insulting and making comments to the smart speaker. How about your parents? There's a movement among many seniors to adopt these devices just because many seniors don't have anyone to talk to. And also, I'm very curious whether any of you have, are early adopters of social audio. Are you setting up your own radio talk or music show? A good friend of mine from college set up his own music program, and he would try to explain to me how to do it. I was sort of interested. But once the explanation went on for 10 or 20 minutes, I had to, like, my mind was overflowing. He finally stopped because it was so complicated to do. But this new, this new social audio programs are making it really easy to do. So I wonder if any of you are early adopters. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to your questions or, or your comments. Do we have any questions that are in the chat, Neil? Um, let me see. I think the chat is mostly populated with comments, but some of them are pretty great. Um, yeah. Yeah. So a number of people are saying they really can't imagine living without radio. Um, we have some love for local. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have some love here for local independent station KYRS, which I can vouch for is fantastic. And that's not the NPR affiliate locally. That's it. It's independent um, and, and very good. Um, let's see what else we have here. The word podcast doesn't feel like a podcast doesn't feel like a real word, um, which, yeah, it's a pretty recent neologism. And I looked it up recently because I wanted to confirm my suspicion that it was related to the iPod. And indeed, yeah. that is what it comes from. Yeah. Um, people were listening to podcasts uh, early on on the early iPods. Um, Let's see. My favorite murder is a podcast that gets a shout out here. I've heard of that. I, I don't know it. Like I haven't listened to it, but I, I know it's popular. It's totally worth at least one listen. It's two uh, women of a certain age just kind of <laughs> chatting about some murder that they researched. And it's kind of funny and grim and unique. Their voices really come through. It's worth checking out at least once. Mm -hmm. So David Lasky, you, you're the one who mentioned my favorite murder. Also, you must remember this. Uh, history oh, yeah. of Hollywood's Golden Age. And done with a very evocative narrator who uh, just sounds wonderful and tells you these great stories about Hollywood. Uh, so that's a favorite of many people. Mm -hmm. There's the yeah. comment about independent radio stations. And I, I spent most of my early career working at an independent radio station, not public radio. Um, there's a whole movement I alluded to in the talk about Pacifica Radio which started stations in major markets like New York and Washington, D.C. And, and Houston, Texas. And they spawned what's called the community radio movement, which mm -hmm. developed small stations all over the country, which is where I got to start. And it sounds like, what was the call letters of that station you mentioned? KYRS. Yeah, it's Thin Air Community Radio. Yeah, community radio is kind of the rubric under which it all goes. It's a really interesting sidelight. And when I got involved in the 70s, it was we were all very passionate about it because there was we felt there was no way for people to actually control the airwaves it was all controlled by big businesses the landscape has changed over the years but community radio has really been a, a vital form and a changing form in radio and i mentioned low power fm briefly a lot of those stations are even more community focused there's mm -hmm. one in south seattle and just focusing on its neighborhood so it can do great things that even your local public radio station won't do because they're talking to a much larger audience mm -hmm. Yeah, so folks, feel free to unmute. Um, as is often the case in these situations, I have a lot of thoughts, but I don't want to dominate the conversation. So, um, Adela. Yes. Oh, are you unmuted yourself, so I figured you might have something to say. Oh, oh no, I just, um, <laughs> I'm, I may, no, I love radio. Um, I have to say, I still listen to it every day, but I, I probably don't listen to it as much as I did say 20 or 30 years ago. Right. Um, I think 
I'm sad to say that maybe TV has taken over more of radio time for me, but um, yeah, I've, I've always been a radio listener. I listened as a kid to all those old radio programs, uh, mm. Rochester and um, Fibber McGee and Molly, all those old radio programs, yeah. So I grew up listening to it. And I like different stations at different times, but I'm mostly um, public radio person. But I'm happy to hear about that community radio station in Spokane that I didn't know about. Thank you. And the, the kind of amazing thing about radio now, I mean, we have podcasts sort of invading radio space, but also there's a, a really wonderful um, app that I would strongly recommend that you check out. And it basically allows you to go all over the world and look for radio stations. And it's got a picture of the globe. It's called Radio Garden. And you can, you can go, for example, to Ukraine and listen to what radio stations in Ukraine are broadcasting right now. Mm. It's really easy to wow. use. And you just get an amazing sense of what radio does around the world. Um, radio is under some pressure in certain quarters, but I, I have a feeling it will evolve once again to its strengths. And when something live is happening, it, it becomes vital. Certainly when you're driving, it's, it's very vital. Uh, but it is kind of, some of the enthusiasm for radio has been sapping, partly because of podcasts. Um, maybe radio is not doing as good a job as it should be doing of innovating and presenting new types of information. But uh, we'll see how that progresses in the future or regress. And what was the name of that again? I'm sorry, Radio It's called what? Radio Garden. It's an Garden. app that you can pull up, yeah. And uh, well, I really, I, oh, I really like your comment that it's very true that radio does take more imagination to listen, you know, it, to which which is an appeal to me. So, yeah, my 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 entry my entry level radio was uh, CBS Mystery Theater. I remember listening to that as a kid, and it was so kind of blew my mind that they could create all these work pictures for me. Right. Thank you. Um, I wanted to mention that um, in the last few years, while I've listened to news, I've particularly been riveted by the um, Supreme Court uh, uh, hearings, um, because generally NPR will devote whatever time is necessary to cover pretty much all of it, I think, live. And it's just, I there's no point in my day where I will sit in front of the television and watch that, but I will listen to it when I'm going about my business. And it's really been helpful for me to get a sense of what's going on. And, and I do think that's an example of where emotions are captured, you know, and the kind of the tenor of the situation is captured by audio live, which is powerful. And it's a, and again, that, that's a major moment. The Supreme Court justice doesn't go before Congress every day. So it's a major historical moment and you're listening to it live and it's, there's nothing, you're not getting it at all sort of processed a lot of information like that, you pick it up afterwards and depending which media outlet you're listening to, you'll get, it'll be processed. They will select what it is to hear. But if you're listening, you do the processing. You can focus in on what you find interesting and form your own impressions of it. It's, it's one of the great things that public radio does is to provide that. Mm -hmm. David mentioned Pacifica Radio in the comments. I think you had mentioned that just not long ago, Ross. Yeah. You made reference to it, yeah. Yeah, Pacifica Radio, uh, Interestingly enough, the uh, if you're familiar with public radio, you're familiar with pledge drives. It did not start with public radio. It started with Pacifica Radio, mm. which began at KPFA in the Bay Area. And uh, a guy by the name of Lou Hill came up with this kind of crazy idea that listeners could support radio. And it was back to this very ideal, idealistic notion of what radio could do, how it could transform society, how it could connect us. And uh, it started, this is once one of the other benefits of the early days of FM when stations were relatively easy to acquire. So they got KPFA in the Bay Area, they got WBAI in New York City, and they formed a network around the country. It was very controversial. Their Houston station got bombed. The transmitter was bombed at one point because they were presenting radical perspectives on the Vietnam War and radical mm -hmm. pol political perspectives in the time. The, one of the problems with Pacifica though is it's gotten really kind of bogged down in a lot of internecine battles as many organizations on the left have done. Uh, there, everyone's fighting for what they believe is the true vision of what uh, what Pacifica Radio should be. 
Mm. And uh, consequently, I think they, they're not paying enough attention to listeners as they, as they should be. That's a personal opinion of mine. But they've been usually influential. And uh, I mentioned community radio a little bit earlier. That all came out of Pacifica. All of us who started in community radio were sort of inspired by what was going on with Pacifica. I like how you mentioned, well, Wolfman Jack, I remember him from living in the Bay Area during the late 60s, early 70s. And those personalities that we had back then, um, and we don't seem to have as many these days like, like that. I was also thinking of a radio personality popular in Salt Lake City at the time I lived there, Will Lucas, but I, I'm not familiar with any, any in the local areas. But you know, maybe... not, not as much. I mean, I, here in Seattle, um, we have uh, KEXP, which is a wonderful independent music station, and the same DJs have been on forever. So you kind of get to know them and what their taste is in music. But the era of Wealthman Jack partly took place because he was broadcasting from Mexico for a lot of his career. And in Mexico, the stations did not have the same kind of restrictions on their power. So he was on a station that could broadcast over a huge swath of the United States because it was outside the control of the Federal Communications Commission. So he reached a giant audience that other people were not able to do. Interesting. If there are no further questions or comments, um, I will uh, just summarize by saying thank you so much for spending some time with me this afternoon. I really appreciate it. This is what my one of my two retirement projects, three retirement projects. One is doing these talks, which has been just a great opportunity to visit the state virtually. And hopefully I'll come someday to Spokane to do a talk in person. That would be great. I'd love to do that. And uh, my other project is, I mentioned a little bit earlier, RossReynolds.com, a place where I've been having so much fun going back and listening to my 20 year old uh, radio interviews. A lot of the radio that I did back in the day was of the moment and doesn't really age very well, but there's a fair amount of it that I've been able to go back to and discover and go, this is actually a, a pretty great thing to be able to present again. So take a moment to go over there and check it out. I'm fairly sure there'd be something there that you find interesting. It's about, it's politicians, it's artists, it's novelists, it's political thinkers. It's a wide variety of stuff that's up there. Well, thank you for uh, mentioning that, Ross, and, and thank you so much for joining us today. I will say that uh, before the presentation, speaking of the difference between live radio uh, and podcasts, uh, a number of people contacted me to say they would have loved to attend live, but they look forward to seeing the recording. So there you okay. go. It's, right. it's, it's, a, it's a thing. Um, so yes, thank you so much for your time and your, you uh, your commentary and um, thank you to all of you for attending. I appreciate seeing your, your faces and hearing your voices. Thank you. And, and thank you. Neil, I really appreciated this. Thank you so much. And Neil, ping me with thank that you link when, when, you, uh, when you have that go up because I'd like to take a look at it. Absolutely, I will. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great day, everybody. This was terrific. Thank you. You bet. All right.